So good evening. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the Dar al Noor Islamic Community Center and the uh, Prince William School Board Chair Debate, sponsored by Inside Nova, the League of Women Voters, and Dar al Noor. Thank you for coming out this evening. Uh, this is an important position in our county. Uh, we have three outstanding ca candidates who are running for the office of School Board Chairman. We're delighted to have all three of them here with us this evening. Before we get started with the debate, I'd like to ask the uh, scouts from the Troop 5404 to present the colors and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Gentlemen. Thank you, and please be seated. Again, welcome. My name is Bruce Potter. I'm the publisher of Inside Nova here in Prince William County. We publish a weekly newspaper, many of you know, called Inside Nova Prince William. And of course, our website is online at insidenova.com. We have copies of our newspaper on the back tables, along with some other magazines that we publish in uh, Prince William County out of the Gainesville and Haymarket area. Um, I'll introduce the candidates in a few minutes, but first I'd like to, uh, most importantly, thank the fine folks here at the Muslim Association of Virginia for their showing us their amazing hospitality this evening. I'd like to uh, specifically thank and recognize the chairman of the board, Rafi Ahmed. The, the president, Hassan Islam. And, and Nathan Mallory, I'm not sure what Nathan's title is, Mr. Everything. They, they graciously opened their doors to us tonight at no charge, set up the room for the event, provided some refreshments for afterward. We certainly appreciate all of that. And a commercial on behalf of the Islamic Center, they're holding their annual community block party this Saturday, uh, October 13th, right here, from noon to 4 p.m. It's always a great time with lots of fun and festivities, so be sure to, be sure to stop by on uh, Saturday afternoon. It should be nice weather and, and check that out. I'd also like to thank our other partner, partner, the League of Women Voters, which helped us to promote tonight's event and organize it in terms of getting the questions together. And I'd like to introduce at this time Carol Proven, the president of the Prince William chapter. Carol? I would like to thank you all for coming. This is really a wonderful place to meet. We've had debates here before, and they've always been very well attended. So thank you again. And I would like to thank Carol Noggle, who is our uh, chief questioner and uh, spearhead. Where is Carol? She left. Oh, there she is. <laughs> she didn't leave. So thank you very much for all of your work. And we look forward to a spirited debate. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Carol. So now I'd like to go over some ground rules uh, for the, tonight's debate. The uh, rules have been shared with our three candidates. Each candidate will be given two minutes for an opening statement at the beginning of the debate and two minutes for a closing statement at the end of the debate. The order of the opening and the closing statements was determined by lot. Following the opening statement, I will ask a series of questions with the same question addressed to all three candidates. The order in which the candidates answer the questions will, will rotate. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer each question. Because there are three candidates, and it can get very confusing very quickly, uh, there is no rebuttal time specifically allowed. If a candidate wishes to rebut something that another candidate said, he or she may do so as part of their answer to the next question. Uh, 
would ask, please, we are taping the debate, please be respectful of everyone and the candidates and refrain from any outbursts, loud cheers, boos, catcalls, interruptions, etc. cetera. Uh, we have some uh, young ladies in the front row who will serve as our timers this evening. They have yellow and red cards. They will hold up a yellow card when the candidate has 30 seconds remaining. And then they will hold up the red card when the candidate's two minutes has expired. And at that point, I'll start interrupting you all. So, um, As I mentioned, we are, um, thanks to Bill Golden here in the middle, we, we are taping tonight's debate. Uh, it will be available for viewing on InsideNova.com sometime, hopefully tomorrow, technology permitting. Uh, we also will probably need to be doing some Facebook Live uh, during the debate with our editor, Greg Hambrick, who's back here. We will end the debate promptly at 8.30 p.m., if not a couple of minutes before. Um, the mosque has prayers that begin at 8.30, um, so we want to be respectful of that. So we will be over before, slightly before 8.30. As I mentioned, this is a very important position here in Prince William County. Uh, the Prince William County school system, I believe, is the second largest school system in the state of Virginia. Uh, last time I heard, there are over 90 different dialects and languages spoken in the Prince William County school system. And I believe it is also the county's largest employer. So it's very, this is a very important uh, election that we have coming up on November 6th to determine who will lead our school system for the next year. Uh, whoever wins in November will have to run for re-election next November for a full four-year term. So and now I'm delighted to introduce the three candidates for school board chairman. To my immediate right is Allison Satterwhite. Allison is serving her second four-year term as the school board representative from the Gainesville District. She has served as a volunteer for a number of different education organizations. And all four of her children attended Prince William Public Schools. Allison, thank you for being here. In the uh, middle up here is Stanley Bender. Mr. Bender is a retired program analyst for the Department of Defense and a Marine Corps veteran. He lives in Woodbridge, and all of his children also attended Prince William County Schools. Mr. Bender, thank you. And on the far end from me is Dr. Babur Latif. Dr. Latif is the interim school board chairman appointed after the previous chairman resigned this spring. Dr. Latif is an ophthalmologist in Woodbridge, and he and his wife have four children in the Prince William County Public Schools. Dr. Latif, thank you for being here. So as I mentioned, we have uh, Drawn by a lot of the candidates, we'll proceed with their opening statements in the order they are seated um, up here, starting with Ms. Satterwhite and going down the table from there. So they each have two minutes for their opening statement, and we're just going to do everything from the table. So Ms. Satterwhite, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. It is such a pleasure to see all of you here tonight. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedules to join us. As you are all aware, this is a very important position, and we've seen the past two years how much more important this position is and why we need to pay attention to school board races and why we need to pay attention to the chairman's race. So thank you for taking an active interest in being here with us tonight. So my name is Allison Satterwhite. I am serving in my second term for the Gainesville District, and I'm running to be your chairman for the school board. And I want to thank you um, all again for being here. So I am the mother of four children. So my youngest just graduated last year in 2017. I have 15 years experience in Prince William County Schools as a parent for my children who've been here. Um, it's not 15 continuous years because my husband's retired Navy, so we lived here in the area, we moved away, we came back. But I have many, many years as an experienced parent and recent years as an experienced parent for Prince William County Schools. Everything from gifted education to special education and classes in between and general education. So I understand and I know what our parents are going through because I've lived it myself. Once my youngest graduated last year in 2017, I had gone through 24 years of IEP meetings for several of my kids total. And uh, several of them were free for speech, but my youngest, it was other health impaired and some more difficult things with the IEP. 
And so I understand why we need to partner with our children, or with their students, with our families, why it's so important we advocate for our families. And so I've been a strong advocate for our parents, and I will continue to be a strong advocate for our parents. That's what I've done since even before I ran the school board. And so that's, I am running to put students first in the school board. We've had a couple of years we've been distracted, and it's important that our students are our first priority as our school board. Thank you again for being here tonight, and look forward to talking with you tonight. Thank you. And now we will hear an opening statement from Mr. Bender. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Close the microphone close to your uh, face. There you go. Testing. How was that? Very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. When did we start? The two minutes. Now? Please, go ahead. Okay. My name is Stan Bender. Sorry, I have to. I'm sorry. I have to read this over paper. But sometimes you need specific data to assess the fact, what am I doing here? Well, I've been in the county for 40 years. I've worked as a civil service employee for the Naval Air System Command. And I've been uh, abreast of millions of dollars. And I've done very, very well in retaining material for the Navy aircraft. And anything new and anything old, I was always there uh, to defend their budget. And the budget facilities at that Pentagon is unbelievable. Now, I don't think the people would understand because you don't have, ever, have never had any knowledge. In the meantime, uh, I, I was a first responder. I'm a volunteer fireman and was a volunteer with the Prince William County Sheriff's Office and the department and a member of the jail board. As a mentor, I've always been interested in young people and helping them attain their inclusion skills to lead production and full lives. This is the reason I'm running for the school board. In my opinion, our school will need to assess how they are preparing our youth for today's jobs. Uh, I talked to somebody else a little earlier. Uh, robotics have to be implemented in our schools on a very st early stage. I spoke to some doctor from John Hopkins over the weekend. For your information, I was just amazed at what I would do. So if I'm, uh, I'm uh, elected by the people of Prince William, I'm certainly going to push our teachers for advanced technical knowledge and business. Many companies are hiring people to teach them the needed skills and at a good salary, benefits, path to advancement, these jobs are in automotive construction, aircraft mechanics, etc. The economy says these jobs is not passing. That will change soon. But so this job market is here for a long term. Many of these skilled trade jobs pay significantly more than many young get when they graduate from college and have to have benefits of having a crippling college debt. In many cases, it takes years to repay. Mr. Bender, sorry, your time is up. Thank you. Dr. Latif. Good evening. Buenas noches. Ni hao. Salam alaikum. I'm delighted to greet you in many of the languages spoken in our community. Our school system is one of the most diverse in the United States of America, and I am proud to serve as chairman of the Prince William County School Board. I would like to thank Inside Nova, the League of Women Voters, and Darrell Moore for hosting this debate. I've been an eye surgeon serving the people of Prince William County for the last 15 years. Over that time, I've taken care of adults, children, veterans, and the disabled. I've been a public servant over that time as well. I volunteer my time with patients at the Prince William Area Free Clinic in overseas missions. I am running to remain chairman of the Prince William County School Board because I am a product of public education. Public education worked for me from kindergarten through medical school. I wanted to work for all the children of Prince William County. From the moment I was appointed chairman of the school board, I met with the system's leadership and school board members to discuss my priorities. We talked about student success, safety and security of our students and staff, space and infrastructure needs, and teacher salaries. Our whole family cares deeply about education. We have been active in PTO leadership of all the schools that our four children attend. My wife is a pediatric neurologist and takes care of many children with special needs. She has, a success, she has successfully served on the Superintendent's Advisory Council and, the, and on the Governor's SOL Reform and Innovation Committee. 
I've been a member of the Spark Foundation Board and the Board of Visitors at the University of Virginia. We are both professors and teach at George Washington University School of Medicine. My priorities come from these experiences, so I was encouraged to see the superintendent's budget priorities fall in line with my agenda. They include increasing teacher salaries, reducing class sizes, increasing mental health counselors, increasing career and tech ed programs, establishing new courses, and preserving our pre-K programs. Evidence of my effective leadership has been a culture of collaboration that has resulted in a number of unanimous votes on important issues regarding transparency and accountability. I believe my leadership can affect real change that will address the problems that exist in our school system. If you want to see expected, proven leadership make changes our community desires, then vote for me. Barbara Latif is November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Latif. The, uh, no, the, seriously, the thanks to the League of Women Voters for putting together a really great series of questions. I know this is the, uh, maybe the third time that you all have met. I think we have some, we have some different questions and some different topics to, to cover this evening and some topics of interest to the local community. Um, as we agreed at the outset, uh, we're going to rotate the order of questions. So each candidate will have an opportunity to answer each question um, in, in the order in which they uh, which we've rotated. So uh, the first question will go first to Ms. Satterwhite, and then Mr. Bender and then Mr. Latif will answer the same question, then we'll proceed from there. So the first question, the retention of retention and quality of teachers and school employees is always an issue. What ideas do you have for making Prince William County schools competitive with surrounding jurisdictions in terms of teacher and employee pay, training, and benefits. Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you. Retention, quality, teachers, employees. We have not a problem with retention. Why? Because our counties to the west of us, excuse me, to the north of us and to the east of us are paying their teachers more. One of the biggest reasons the counties to the north of us and the east of us are paying their teachers more is because they have a higher um, they have a higher, sorry, words, <laughs> sorry, sometimes words fail me, um, commercial, they have a higher commercial tax base. Because they have a higher commercial tax base, they have more money going into education that we don't have in Prince William County that we're missing out on. Now recently the Board of County Supervisors this year has said we are going to dedicate more money toward, or we're going to dedicate more resources into trying to increase our commercial tax base. We desperately need that in Prince William County. We've become very much a bedroom community, and right now, what we have paying for our teacher salaries is based on your tax dollars and based on what we get from the state and the federal government. We've got to increase the commercial tax base. If we can do that, then yes, it will be much easier to pay our teachers more every single month. We can't afford to lose our teachers to our neighboring counties. We invest in them, we train them, they come to us highly qualified, we can't afford to lose them. So what do we need to do? Number one is work on the BOCS and say, we have to have more commercial, and not just hourly paying jobs, they have to be well-paying jobs so that we can not only live in Prince William, but also work in Prince William. To keep it competitive, uh, we also need to look at our health packages. Um, healthcare has gone up, as you know. Several years ago, Prince William County Schools became self-insured, which is one of the smartest things Prince William County Schools could have done before we entered the healthcare crisis. It's kept our costs down, but still, when our health care goes up, it goes up to the point where teachers don't even see the whole um, salary increase they might get that year, and that's detrimental. So I've asked our staff members just this year again, what can we do to decrease, decrease our health care costs, and we're going to continue to work on that. Okay, thank you. Lots of issues there. Mr. Bender, employee, teacher, pay, and retention. Okay. Uh, Education describes the knowledge, skills, and experience and attributes that students must have to attain and be successful in college. And in order to do that, we have to we all have to get out of, we have to get out of the box. We have to have students come first. Students is our most important thing, and we know we're not going to get there without money. No matter what we say here, what we do here what we plan here. The education system changes momently. It changes from, as I was talking to somebody this morning, I talked to a doctor from uh, John Hopkins the other day, and he was talking to me about robotics. Robotics is so important, I don't know where it will fall, but as a chairperson, 
I will see that we have a highly technical qualified, if possible, teachers. If we don't, I and I really want to send teachers back to school. When I worked for the government, I was always going to a school, no matter where it was and what it was for, uh, to understand the systems that I was working on and why uh, Congress should be paying for these systems. Again, it, it allows me to say that to you citizens, when you uh, when you pay uh, the government your taxes, you've got to have really intelligent people move that money around. Well, even though we're not the government here, we're just normal citizens, I'm telling you now, as a shale board person, I'm looking for a highly technical and business school. Now, the only way you're going to get that is to continually strive the existing teachers and send them to different courses during the year. I don't know whether you realize it or not. Young doctors today go back to school all the time. I know that for a fact. You call your doctor up and say, where is he? So I'm looking for, I don't know the amount of time and amount of attention is paid to the teachers, but we're not going anywhere without those teachers. I wouldn't be here today without teachers. So I have much Thank to you. say. Thank you. Um, but, well, thank you, sir. It's, it's no secret that we have the lowest teacher salaries in the region. We have the highest class sizes in the region. All of this affects how a teacher feels and how they uh, teach in the classroom. We have to do better to pay our teachers more. We have to do better to reduce class sizes. Both of these things will go hand in hand in helping our students directly in the classroom. I'm proud to say the superintendent announced in his uh, budget priorities, teacher salary increase that would be uh, both a step increase in Anacola for the first time in a decade. That will be the budget priority as we enter the season this year. Besides paying them more, we have to look at other ways where we can keep them and recruit them. Continuing education is important. Currently, we haven't increased their tuition reimbursement when they go on and do master's courses and extra extra courses to supplement their, um, their background. We have to do that. We haven't done that in over 10 years. Chesapeake Bay City Schools has a health care plan that if you go on your um, well checks, um, and if you do that every year, you get $25 back in your paycheck, each paycheck. That's $600. That comes out to about 1% on a 60000 year salary. There are ways to get money back to them without necessarily going to the County Board of Supervisors or the state. So there are other programs we can do to try to retain them. We have a current problem where a teacher can leave our county after she's done a great job teaching a big class size, she's highly recruited to go up to Fairfax because she's done a great job with a big class. What will she do with a smaller class? It'll be you know, far better. But she can also then come back into our school system after a year at a higher salary than the folks who stayed in the school system with the same step. That's a problem. These are problems we have to address and fix to make it for, more fair for our teachers. How do we do this? We have, to, we have to advocate more on behalf of our school system to the County Board of Supervisors Make them understand investing in our teachers is investing in our community. In the long run, will get us the, the tax base, the property value increases that we need to sustain a massive school system that we have here. Thank you. Thank you. The next question will go first to Mr. Bender. Uh, and this follows on the last question. Obviously, uh, Revenues in the school board budget is a is a big issue that the board and the school system faces every year. The school board and the county board of supervisors have a revenue sharing agreement that sets a certain percentage of county revenues that go to the school system. What actions would you take to guarantee that schools receive the funding they need to expand, provide smaller class sizes, eliminate trailers? renovate aging buildings, and of course, as we just discussed, pay teachers what they deserve to be paid. Yeah, that's a big question. And one of the first things I would uh, possibly say is uh, education describes the knowledge, skills, experience, and attributes that students must attain. In order to us to meet the requirement you just delineate for money, et cetera, et cetera, we can you continue to come back to the same question? These challenges should be referred to as requirements to meet objectives. Have no knowledge of challenges will be impossible 
for me to answer. So uh, as far as the question that still goes, we continue to learn what we, no matter how we come out of here, the bottom line is still teachers and money and future education. And uh, I don't feel that anybody has said what I have would say. I'm trying to prepare for objectives and skills. And what I mean by objectives and skills, I'm going to have people out of the box to help get the objectives. Once those objectives are reached, I then would go to the county board. I expect myself and people that support me to provide the board with what we're really doing. Knowing from where I was with the EOD, I assure you, those people weren't as smart as you. But once you advise them and prepare them for what you were doing and where the money was going, I didn't have a problem getting a budget. So here again, we come back to the same thing again, money and teachers. So that's about all I have to say to that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lucy. So regarding funding for our school system, about 43, 44% of our funding for the entire school system comes from the County Board of Supervisors. About 40% comes from the state in Richmond, and about 20% comes from the federal government. Much of the federal government money is ear earmarked or um, uh, restricted funds, so we can't really do a whole lot with that. When we look at the revenue sharing agreement, that's um, what we get as a school system every year. It's an agreement that was made years ago with the school board and the County Board of Supervisors. The problem with this agreement is that the number is too low. We don't get enough to keep up with the growth and build the infrastructure we need to handle the growing population of students. We don't get enough to pay our teachers. We pay our teachers the lowest in the region with the highest class sizes. We have the lowest per people spend in Northern Virginia. We spend about $9,800 per student per year. Arlington spends $17,000. Fairfax is in the 13 and Loudoun in the 12,000 range. We are way behind our neighbors. We have to do better at that. Do better at that by advocating to the County Board of Supervisors our needs more effectively. It hasn't been done in the last seven years, the last ten years. We just not haven't done that as well as we need to. We haven't done a good job in this county at controlling growth. That needs to be done as well. So good relationships with the County Board of Supervisors letting you know that the revenue sharing agreement is just the floor. It's not the ceiling. We can ask for more, we deserve more, we need more. Getting more will allow us to create a community where more people will come and invest. Secondly, in Richmond, I was on the Governor Northam and Governor McCullough's transition team. I have a good relationship there. We have a new friend in Richmond. He's the Secretary of Education. He happens to be a teacher from Prince William County, out of Kearney. Good relationships there will benefit us here. We can advocate more effectively. We are the second lar largest school system in the, count in the Commonwealth. The Governor cares what we believe. When we tell him we need more money for teachers, he understands it. That's coming from the second largest county. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Satellite. Thank you. One of the first things that happened when I joined the board was in 2012, we formed the Brinksville Gainesville Budget Con Budget Committee. And it was formed, it was con um, consisted of parents and teachers, community members, and we made a huge difference in Prince William County Schools. One of the things our committee pointed out was that there were lots of funds that were had huge carryover amounts, millions of dollars of carryover year after year after year. And we're like, wait a minute, that's money that needs to be spent on our students. And so those funds have tightened up over the years. That money has gone back into our general fund so we could spend it on teacher salaries, so we could spend it on reducing class sizes and put it in the priorities of the school board. Now, another thing that we've done, the um, we challenged the superintendent several years ago, we need to reduce class sizes. We did have the largest class sizes in the state, and so we've got to reverse this. Now, our neighbors have gone up to the top, and I don't believe they've started reducing it. But we told the superintendent, we need a plan, we need to start reducing class sizes, and we did. Not only did we start reducing class sizes, but we also received a $1 million class size reduction grant from the Board of County Supervisors. And so we have started working on it. So when the superintendent has put class size reduction in his budget for this coming year, he's proposing that, that's a continuation of what the school board has been working on for years. And we will continue to work on because it's important. My son, when he was receiving some medical care, he was in smaller class sizes. I saw up close and personal how much of an impact it makes when our students have smaller dedicated class sizes because they do increase in their academics. They do succeed much better when they have more dedicated attention from their teachers. Um, also, 
We need to put more money in our schools. We simply do not give our teachers enough money in their budgets at the beginning of the year. We have to do better. Um, we need more money for classrooms, for field trips. Special education, I didn't see a notice in those six items the superintendent just proposed to us last Wednesday night. I did not see an item in there for special education. We recently had a special education audit. Why wasn't special education in those top six priorities the superintendent just gave to us? That doesn't make sense. I want to mention robotics. Well, I'll bring that up later. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sadaway. The, uh, uh, it's been raised already the fact that Prince William County's uh, tax base tends to rely more on residential than commercial development. And at the same time, new home development obviously adds to the burden on the school system by requiring additional schools, classrooms, teachers, etc. Can you discuss the impact of new home development on the increased school population and how you would work to achieve a balance of competing interests? Sure. Um, you know, as you stated, our, our revenues come primarily from the property tax. And we, as a school system, depend heavily on that. Now, the number of things. Over the years, we've seen incredible growth in our county. And the problem is the County Board of Supervisors continues to approve projects that don't have uh, attached to it appropriate funding for our schools. For example, you know, prior to a couple years ago, if a developer wanted to build a, a development, they would negotiate with the county board for proffers. Proffers are monies that the, the developer would contribute towards the school system to help either build schools, expand schools, or address the increased population that will come from that. Part of the problem is the proffers were never negotiated very well. So even with the proffers, we stayed behind. We never were able to keep up with the growth of the schools, which is why we have such overcrowding. Two years ago, the General Assembly decided to pass a law that said we can't any longer negotiate with the developers on proffers. We can't ask for them. We can't demand them. So that really hamstrings the school board. It hamstrings the county board of supervisors in a sense that you know we, we have a difficult time dealing with how to negotiate for proffers. So we have a we have to do better with the County Board of Supervisors in controlling the growth. This County Board of Supervisors can just say no to a development. They don't, they, there's many reasons for that. And one of the notes is that we don't have the infrastructure to support that. And until we do, we're not gonna promote that growth. Secondly, what can I do as a County Board Chair for the school? I can't raise your taxes, so I can advocate on raising them or advocate on getting more resources. But more importantly, if we get our schools performing better, and we have a destination community where more of our high schools are in the top 100, then our property values go up. I haven't met a person who's willing to pay, you know, isn't as unhappy to pay taxes when they increase their equity in their house. So I'd like to help you all increase your equity in the house by having better schools. Thank you. Ms. Sandler. Thank you. So as I said, we do have a higher residential tax base than commercial tax base, and we've got to change that. We have to address it. It's very upside down in our county. Now, how does that impact your school population? Well, as you've seen, as you all know very well, we've had rapid growth over the last decade, decade, decade and a half of Prince William County. Our school board has been united and very aggressive in saying no to developments where, our, where the schools have crowding where the um, capacity is over 100%. And we've been very, very vocal of that for some time. For example, um, Battlefield High School, Patriot High School, both of those have either just over or close to 3,000 students right now in schools that are built for 2,053 students. And so anything that's being proposed in those areas right now, the school system is saying, no, we cannot support that growth. Now, the school board does not have the authority to turn down a housing development. That belongs solely to the Board of County Supervisors. That is their jurisdiction. We have to say, this is what the impact is going to be to the schools. It's called the Development Impact Statement. Um, so we have to continue to work with the Board of County Supervisors. We have to work with all of you. We need you to advocate with us, saying, our, we have areas where our schools are incredibly overcrowded. The Eastern Elementary Schools, we're trying very hard to catch up with the building. Our Western High Schools, we're working very hard. We've got that 13th High School in line, and we're already looking at 14th for Eastern into the county. So we need for you to work with us and advocate for us also. We have got to catch up. We need to get our kids out of trailers. Now, there is a plan for that to happen. And the superintendent gave us, in last year's budget, he gave us a five-year um, supplemental budget that would get our kids out of trailers. 
It's an ambitious budget. It would, different supervisors have talked about things like a levy or an extra tax, but it would take the support of all of you as citizens to make it happen because it would be expensive. But we could get our kids out of trailers, we could get our kids in classrooms, and we could catch up with our growth in the county. And that's not counting for the new growth that would happen in the county. Now also for that to happen, we have to make sure that our numbers are good in the school system, that we have a CIP that is based on reliable numbers, and we're working on that too. Thank you. Hey, uh, I have to apologize. I'm really not in the ball game that these two gentlemen are in. We've both been in the school system for umpteen years. So, as far as trying to get money out of the county or from Congress, Congress pays less than 10% to the county for a school system. And I don't wish to repeat what these two people have already said to you. Eventually, sooner or later, the county's going to have to come to a stop somewhere. But as long as we keep having children, we're going to keep police schools, and we're going to keep paying for them. So you can imagine one thing that's going to come out of our taxes. And if you think it isn't, you're going to pay for the fire department, the police department, and the school. So don't feel lonely when someone knocks on your door and says, hey, we're going to raise your taxes 2%. 2% of what you have are very, very I know it for people that are retired. We have thousands of people in this county that are retired. So, sorry, uh, the mic was off. Okay. To reiterate, I, I said we have thousands of people in this county, and I don't want to reiterate what the two people here just said. I want you to understand when we leave here tonight, we are all going to be apprised somewhere in time for us that the taxes are going up. There's no magic. I don't care what you say. We may not want it. We all want the golden rule. We want our kids to be educated. We want their kids to be educated. We're going to have to pay for it. There's no doubt about it. Where are you going to get it from? Most important, to get that money, we have to have educated kids. We need technicians. We need engineers. We need doctors. We need nurses. They're the ones that are going to pay our pay our homes for school system. So once again, I want to, I like to hear what these two people have said. I certainly agree with the end to say, but we're not going to get away from paying for anything in this county. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, left side of the table here, Ms. Satterwhite will answer first. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the um, diversity and the, the demographic uh, variety that we have here in Prince William County from income level to housing quality to uh, different cultures, different nationalities that are represented in our school system and even different amenities at different schools across the county. How do you plan on ensuring equality in the quality of education for all students from east to west in Prince William County? Thank you. So the school board passed, it was approximately a year, year and a half ago, the Infrastructure Task Force. And that was something that Mr. Trenman proposed, and the school board passed it. I'm very excited to say that we will get our final report later on this year. The idea behind it is we wanted to look at all of our schools, especially our aging schools, how can we bring them up to make them as equal as we possibly can with our newer schools. And they're looking specifically at things like technology. They're looking at the building itself. What are the things we need to do? So we received our elementary school report last year, and some of the things in the elementary school report are going to be included in our CIP. Some of the things are going to be included when we do our seven or 14 where we do refreshes, or when we go in and do more of the construction there, like if we're adding a story room or a gym or something like that. So we are incorporating a lot of those suggestions, and we'll continue to look at that. One of the things we also did um, as a part of that, we looked at the um, security upgrades that were recommended in that report, and we took $1 million of the fiscal year 18 money, last year's money, and we went ahead and dedicated that toward the security upgrades. And we said, we don't want to put it in the 19 budget. We want to say now we are dedicating this to security upgrades. We want them done. And so those projects will be completed by the end of this current school year because we expedited that. So I'm very happy that we worked on that. And how are we going to make things equal? We're going to work to make them as equal as we possibly can. Now, you can't make a, a Stonewall Jackson as brand new as a Pilgrim High School. 
But there are things that we can do. Um, one of the things I would love to see, if we could even just change the cafeteria furniture to make it more up to date. So in the student areas where they gather, they're more comfortable for the students. That's going to do a whole lot for the student spaces and for the morale of the students. And we're doing that in some areas. We have, we have schools where um, the, the staff is going in and they're painting some of the walls. They're putting inspirational comments in the walls. We are working very hard. We, we prize every single one of our students. We want each one of them to succeed. And we're working very hard to make sure that we are putting the resources where we need to. We actually dedicated extra money into our budget last year to make sure that our students in lower income schools were actually getting the extra help that they needed in their education. Thank you. Mr. Bender, how do you plan on ensuring equality and the quality of education across the county? <laughs> Tough question. Uh, from my point of view, from, from where I, from where I come from, uh, first of all, for me, every student counts. No such student who doesn't know, can't do it, wouldn't do it. I would appreciate if you repeat that question one more time. I don't care about my time. <laughs> How do you plan to ensure equity in the quality of education for all students across the county, regardless of their demographics and background? Well, first of all, I don't want to repeat the question a hundred times. It's our teachers. You know, the students today, from what I see, I don't want to talk about respect. I want to talk, I'd rather talk about education. We've got a lot of smart young teachers out there, and we have to defend them. We have to educate them more than just a few years that they're going to stay at the lower grade. You know, a lot of them have lost their responsibility as far as working as teachers. They, these teachers have to feel, which I hope they do when the chair, that this is not just a job. This is what they like to do. I re to reiterate, I worked for the government 20 years. I never had a better job. I've never had a better boss. I've never had better people. So to get these students where we want them, you have to work with them. You work with them. And our teachers are our only hope, and you, the community, must come and support the teachers. It's, only, it's not just always money. Teachers feel very lonely when they're out in the street. And there they are. Very few people acknowledge the teachers unless they have students. So as... Uh, for the committee people, uh, I hope you pass the word. Hey, we've got to get out there and help our teachers. They're, they're not. They're, I've read articles that they don't even want to take the job because they're not respected. They're not respected because the community doesn't respect them. And I hope, from my experience, I have a long term with a lot of people, who, either gender. I've never had a problem. And I mean, I've spoken to very high level people. And the lower Thank people. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. I'm going to ask our young ladies with the cards to keep them held up after your after the, the candidates can see that you're holding them up. Thank you in case they're not looking at you right away. Um, Dr. Latif, how do you plan on ensuring equity in the quality of education for all students across the county? So it's a great question. I think ensuring equity um, starts with leadership from the top. Last year, the school board had a controversial issue where they voted on a non-discrimination policy. My opponent, and it's important to know where we differ, my opponent voted against the non-discrimination policy. She's voted against cultural competency training programs. These are two things that, when you do it from the top, it sets the tone for the rest of the school system. We are as a community not committed to, to discrimination. We're going to work on cultural competency. We have a lot of different students from a lot of different places, and it's important to train our folks that way. We have to strengthen our ESL programs. When we talk about equity in the school system, we have we have construction projects that need to be moved up in the CIP. We have four aging high schools that deserve a lot of work. That's Garfield, Woodbridge Senior High, Brentsville, and Stonewall Jackson. All need a lot of work. And so I have already been on the phone with Chairman Stewart and a number of the County Board of Supervisors demanding that we look at the capital uh, improvement program plan and, and, and commit to redoing those high schools. Now let's talk about achievement, achievement gap. Let's talk about how students perform. We have to look at using programs that invest in STEAM. Um, we have to create STEAM, the STEM education and, and science, technology, engineering, math, and arts. 
We have to look at, we, we have a testing culture in this country. Ever since No Child Left Behind, we've created this testing culture. We need to go back to a learning culture, a culture where we're committed to getting our students to learn more and stop teaching to the test. Now, the eighth grade SOL is a three-year comprehensive test in science. Three-year comprehensive. I went to med school. I, I took a comprehensive exam for three years, only one time in my career. No one takes a three-year comprehensive exam. Why are we putting our students through that? There are many things we need to do, implementing programs that work for gifted kids, spread them out to all the kids. I've seen programs that work tremendously for gifted. There's no reason why those won't work for all the kids. Those kinds of programs have project-based learning. They have um, advantages where we can um, use those to help bring everybody up and raise the bar for the entire community. Thank you. Thank you. The, the next question will go first to Mr. Bender. And we're changing directions here a little bit. Under the, under the previous chairman, at least to uh, an outsider, school board issues seem to become extremely politicized. What will you do as chairman to provide leadership to the board, ensure that all perspectives are heard, and help the school system focus on its stated mission of providing a world-class education rather than on politics? Mr. Bender? First of all, uh, trying to provide these people with a comprehensive, comprehensive uh, experience in the schools. Uh, Please read, could you read that question again? What will you do as chairman to provide leadership to the board to help the school system focus on providing a world class education rather than politics? Well, it, it takes a lot of reform to include a redesign of the high school experience, uh, embedding the 21st century readiness, skills, and the curriculum at all levels, incorporating new requirements for career planning. So we, we haven't changed anything. The only thing we've changed is what do we want to do next to get them over the hump? The only way we're going to get them over that state that we're talking about right now is to hire well trained teachers and continually teachers to go back to school. I haven't changed my mind a bit on that. So I, I wish to, you know, if I am elected school board, I have a lot of camaraderie to make sure these teachers want to stay and they will fit into the positions that they have. I don't have much more to say about that. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Latif? Um, okay, um, regarding leadership, um, you know, you haven't seen my name in the newspapers a lot. So um, I'd like to do no drama. Um, it may not help me win the election if I don't get in the paper a lot, but you will, haven't seen it. And there's a reason for that. I want to work closely, collaboratively with everyone on the board. Everyone who's asked me to put something on the agenda, provided we've gone through a proper vetting with staff and everything like that, it's gotten on the agenda. So I have no desire to block anyone from getting what they need to get on the agenda, whether they're Republican, whether they're Democrat, whether they're independent. Our goals are to do whatever is good for the system. I want to work closely with the superintendent and his staff. I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to address the needs in our system. I think I've done that. The fact that we've had no drama over this time, we've had a number of unanimous votes on issues of accountability and transparency has been critical. I've been excited that we do have a good relationship on that board. We get our meetings done efficiently, and all of that works. When you look at effective leadership in, in how, how, you, how, um, how do you, how do you um, evaluate that, look at some of the things my wife and I have been able to accomplish over this time. I haven't been on the board, but we've been able to instill in the elementary school a program committed to math extension for all students a foreign language program that is not a club, but a robust program, probably the most robust Spanish program in the county. Uh, we have been able to bring to the middle school a science enrichment program that hasn't been there before, and that's also being piloted in four, three other middle schools. That's done through work from going up in the superintendent's advisory council, uh, looking at best practices across the county, trying to share those, trying to expand on them. We've been very successful at doing that. Um, 
So I think when you look at leadership, it, leadership is, you know, Chuck Colgan was fond of saying that if you, you can accomplish a lot if you don't mind who gets the credit. And that's how I approach my leadership position as the chairman of the school board. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. So yes, I did vote against the non-discrimination statement last year, and as I said then, it was undecided law. Our chairman at the time was more interested in national politics than caring about what the people in this county were discussing and wanted to have happen. Um, at that point, the Gavin Grimm case was still headed to the Supreme Court. I said it was irresponsible at that point. We needed to focus on what the people wanted to focus on. Cultural diversity training. I have no problem with cultural diversity training. I wanted us to do what the teachers wanted to do. What I voted against was an expensive school board retreat. And I said, no, we don't need to do that. We can do the same modules that the teachers are doing. And that's what we need to do. Now, under the previous school board chairman, yes, everything was politicized, as I'm sure everybody in this room is aware of. I challenged our previous school board chairman. I stood up to our previous school board chairman, and I did it at a risk, because I was pretty sure he was going to come after me, and he has a couple of times. When he went after Diane Ralston, and he called it, he was starting to recall against her. When he went after Lily Jesse with a FOIA request after she stood up to him at a board meeting, I decided September, two years ago, I said, you know what, I've had enough. I'm going to say something about it board matters, and I'm going to let people know what's going on behind the scenes, because if you don't say it in the board meeting, it hasn't happened. I led the successful censure effort against Chairman Sawyers after he shared confidential information from our board attorney. He shared it in a um, legal filing. It became a public document at that point. I led the special meeting with the school board to accept $20 million from the board, over $20 million from the Board of County Supervisors, so that we could build a larger 13th high school to accommodate the students that we need to accommodate. As it is, the second year of that high school will probably be full and will still be at capacity in our neighboring high schools. We had to fight to get that money for the school board that the Board of County Supervisors was willing to share with us. My opponent, however, my opponent gave money to Ryan Sawyers for his school board and his congressional campaigns. My opponent has endorsed other candidates. I have not, and I will not. I am focused on putting our students first. Thank you. Thank you. The next, the next question goes uh, first to Dr. Latif. Um, the uh, contract of school superintendent Stephen Waltz was not extended this year and currently expires in 2021. I believe his salary is over $300,000 a year. What is your assessment of Dr. Waltz's performance and do you support extending his contract? So his contract already goes till 2021, so there was no reason to extend it now. It still goes for uh, three more years. So at that time, the discussion on a contract extension will come up. And he didn't ask for a contract extension this year, from what I recall. So that'll be something that'll come up later on. Each year, the school board sets up a set of goals that the superintendent is supposed to achieve. Um, that set of goals is what he's evaluated on each year. He is one of the longest serving superintendents in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, this school board has continued to extend his contract far before I got on this board. They've given him pay increases every time over the last few years. And so, you know, I, I would assume that when they have their closed session meetings, they, they feel that the superintendent is accomplishing the goals. We will continue to evaluate the superintendent based on the goals we together set for him. Um, you know, when we, when we look at you know, I'd like to address sort of the support that I have for the past chairman. Um, you know, I I support candidates all the time. And, you know, I've been called hyper-partisan in this race. And it's interesting, both the folks on the top of the ticket for senator of the Commonwealth of Virginia are Chairman Corey Stewart and Senator Tim Kaine. I'm proud to say the last week Senator Kaine endorsed my campaign. Uh, as a former mayor and council member, he understands the importance of education, and he has committed uh, his endorsement to me because he's he's very fond of my ability to lead, and he's excited about my ability to do that. Chairman Stewart, after I was appointed in April, when the newspapers asked him what he thought of it, he said, you know, Dr. Latif was my one-time rival. I've grown to respect him over the years. 
and um, I think he's the right guy at the right time for this job. So it's hard to call me hyperpartisan, or you know, one way or the other. When I have folks on the top of the ticket who both say nice things about me, so I have good relationships with the county board of supervisors, and I wish to leverage those for the benefit of our school system. Thank you. Thank you. The satellite. Thank you. So no, we did not extend the superintendent's salary this year, excuse me, his, his um, contract this year, but there was a vote that was led by the chairman this year that would automatically trigger a salary increase for the superintendent beginning next year in 2019. Automatically trigger. That's something that has not happened in the past with Prince William County Schools because usually the superintendent would come to us every single year and he would negotiate with us. He would ask for something or several things in the school board would decide what we were going to do. And that was usually after we had gone through his um, evaluation. But this time it's an automatic salary increase. If staff receives a COLA, the superintendent receives a COLA. He doesn't have to ask for it anymore, he gets it. And to me that's completely unacceptable. It needs to be something that's decided every single year, not something that's automatic. Our teachers don't get an automatic COLA every year. But the superintendent has that trigger now, and that shows the priorities. And that I did not did not appreciate that. I did not vote for that. I voted against it because it was the wrong thing to do. Um, yes, he is one of the highest paid superintendents um, in the area because he is one of the longest serving, and so seniority definitely adds to that. Um, his contract was extended to 2021 in part because we didn't want then Chairman Sawyers to be choosing our next school board superintendent. So I'll just leave you with that thought. Once again, uh, I had two young people here that uh, have been in the business for a long, long time. It's a tough question for me for any of the senior officers that are leading the staff. Uh, most of them leave staff that they are not satisfied with the job or not satisfied with money. As you know, I'm an independent guy, and I feel down below, if the superintendent feels he's got to leave, we're just going to let him leave. I don't see, with respect to the superintendent, it's very important that he's the last guy on the poll. The county will have to go out on competitive bids, it will come before the board, the board will make an assessment as we're doing tonight to determine the validity of what the new superintendent will be bring to the schools. But again, going back a little bit to the bottom line, taxes. I don't wish your people to feel indifferent than I do. As an independent guy, I don't wish to vote for either party to raise their taxes. So anyhow, getting back to the baseline superintendent, I have no, no really no known knowledge what to do if he fires except to put out a competitive bid, which we used to do all the time at DOD to find the most qualified person. And in the competitive bid were the parameters that we're looking for. Hey, thank you all for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bender. We will uh, now come back to Ms. Satterwhite for the, uh, to answer this question first. Um, changing gears a little bit again, there was a reference earlier to the um, non-discrimination policy on gender identity that was approved by the school board, I believe, about a year ago or so. Can you assess the policy's implementation and effectiveness now, and what changes, if any, would you recommend? The policy has been fully implemented. In Prince William County Schools, we do not discriminate against any of our students. We want each and every one of our students to receive a great education. We care about each and every one of our students. We don't want our students to be bullied. We want our students to feel comfortable and feel safe in our schools, and that is of the utmost importance to each and every one of us. And um, it's the policy's been implemented. Um, I have not heard of any specific problems that are, anything that comes up, it's taken care of very, very, very professional staff. And our staff's done a wonderful job of handling um, situations that have arisen. And so, um, yeah, we're doing a good job. Now, do we have bullying in our schools still? Do we still have mental health problems in our schools? Yes, absolutely we do. And I have been a strong advocate for suicide awareness, for mental health, 
and um, to look out for our students. And mental health is something that we have to look out for our students for. Um, when we're talking about safe schools, that is a huge part of safe schools. If we have healthy students, we're going to have healthier schools. Thank you. Mr. Bender, your thoughts on the non-discrimination policy? I'm not familiar with the problem inside the schools. As you all can see, I'm an outsider. But here again, I'm going to tell you, it's the same old people doing the same old job. I'm telling you one more time. we got to get out of the box. I've never, I've worked for DOD. I've worked with the gender. Some very smart ladies, some very dumb ladies, some smart engineers, and some dumb engineers. So I've never had a problem with gender. I don't even see it in front of me now. I don't even know why we're talking about gender. So as I am the school board. I expect the school system to carry on with respect to what they've been doing the last 110, 20 years. Gender has become a very notable pro problem in the school. And I think the school system now has some way to sustain any problems. So we've got, as I said, these two gentlemen have been there a long time. I don't see any big significant changes in the school. And for myself, I'm a doer. I expect to change one, a lot of things to, to get out of the box. So please vote for me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lutzi? Yeah. He, you know, I was, I was surprised by the controversial nature of the non discrimination policy. Many organizations I've been with, we vote on non discrimination policies. It's a no brainer. You have a policy, you don't need a court case to tell you whether you're going to vote for it or not. It's just flat out the right thing to do. I've taken three oaths in my life. The first oath I take regularly, we did it earlier, was a Pledge of Allegiance. I believe in one nation, and we ought to be indivisible. We ought to be always working to come together, not separate. The second oath I took was a Hippocratic oath when I became a physician. In the 1990s, I was working in an intensive care unit, and the gentleman was dying. There was nothing we could do. He had a do, do not resuscitate order. He asked if his partner could come in the unit with him and stay with him. In those days, the, the rules were you had to be a spouse or a blood relative to come and visit the intensive care unit. Not a single nurse, not a single doctor, not a single administrator in that facility said no. When his partner came in, his face lit up more than any medicine or drug or treatment we could give him. It was the right thing to do. That's what I did, the right thing to do, do no harm. Do the best you can for your patients, for the people, for your neighbors, for your community. Third, whatever the law requires, I took an oath as chairman of the school board to follow the law. The law requires we do not discriminate against anyone for any reason, we will not do that. I'm not in the favor of discriminating against anyone. We have to do everything we can to keep bullying out of the schools. We have to do everything we can to uh, create programs for suicide prevention. We need more mental health counselors. These are all real things that happen. I've had four kids in the school system. One of my sons was bullied. He was handled by the school system very well. But that bullying happened right after the 2016 election when Donald Trump was elected. The rhetoric that comes from the top does trickle down. We as a society have to do better at, at looking at cyberbullying and bullying and the rhetoric we use. It trickles down to our kids and it affects them. And so we have to take a hard look of how we are in a society. So, Controversial non-discrimination policy should not have been a controversial non-discrimination Thank you. The next question goes, next question goes first to uh, Mr. Bender. Um, as you all are, are or have been parents of school students, you know that one of the uh, topics that often comes up at dinner time is what, what time the school starts. And the American Academy of Pediatrics and other health groups recommend that a school start time for middle and high school students no earlier than 8.30 a.m. to overcome the negative impact of too little sleep. Negative results of the early start time include anxiety, problems with attention and memory, poor attendance, and a higher dropout rate, according to the Academy. The challenge, of course, to a later start time is the after-school sports and other activities, uh, after-school jobs, and other inconveniences. Do you think that Prince William County currently has a correct start time for its students across the school system? Would you support any changes in start times for the various schools across the system? Mr. Bender? 
<laughs> well, once again, I, I don't know what's going on in the system, so it's uh, a very unfair question for myself to answer. I can't answer whether these students that are getting up at 8.30 are better off, or if they're getting to school at 7.30, and the other ones getting the younger ones getting to school earlier or getting out uh, earlier. The uh, sports, the, the boys and girls that play sports, I would prefer that they did get to school or, or later. But they have to understand. We have to understand that the sports that they put in are a lot more hours than they would put in the school. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you what a, a, a get an affirmative answer from what doctors in the state have come up with as far as school school time. Prince William will adopt what the governor has decided is relevant to the sports kids that the kids have to come in early or later. So again, I don't want to wish wash here walk around. These two people have much more knowledge than I do. But I want to tell you in one more time, I want to get out of the box. Thank you again. Thank you. Dr. Um, I'm in favor for later start time. Fairfax County does it. My son is in, in uh, Thomas Jefferson's high school and they start later. Uh, I think it's, it's a fantastic um, way to start the day. And, you know, if you, all of us when we went to college, we all avoided that 8 o'clock class, right? We all signed up for that 10 o'clock class. We avoided Friday classes. You know, there's a lot of science to show that the students do better and perform better if they get a little bit more sleep. So I understand the challenges that exist with moving that time clock. It, this is not an issue that I'm going to die on the hill for. This is not, I don't want the headlines to read, Dr. Latif wants to change start times in, in high schools in Prince William County. It's something that I'm, if the community is interested in doing, I'm happy to look at. I think it is an important thing to look at. There's a lot of science out there with school systems that are already doing it. We should look and see what, they're, what they've accomplished with it, uh, what adjustments they've made for the after school jobs, for the after school programs. Um, but. You know, I, I am in favor of it. If the community decided this is something we would do, I'm all in favor of it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Sarawak? Thank you. I think it was in 2010 the Superintendent's Advisory Council picked this up and was considering it under the advice of the superintendent and was studying it. But as you can tell, we didn't change anything. Um, I, medically, there's no doubt it would be in favor of our students if we had leader start times for middle school and high school. Now. That would also mean elementary would have to start earlier. If elementary starting much earlier in the winter, we're going to have elementary students possibly getting on the bus in the dark. So there's a problem with that. So there, there are pros and cons for both approaches. Um, if we did have high school starting later than elementary school, right now we have a lot of our families who are two parents working families, and they rely on their high school student to get the elementary school student off the bus or the middle school students off the bus. They rely on their older children for childcare. So if we reversed it, we wouldn't have anybody over there for the elementary students, for the younger middle school students when they got off the bus. So there's a safety issue, there's a financial impact on our families. And so because we have so many of our families who are they're struggling, we're still struggling, we haven't recovered from the recession. That's something we definitely would have to take into consideration before we ever decided to change something like this. And then, um, and of course, safety. We don't want our elementary school students going home alone. That's never something we want to see happen. So we got to take care of those babies. And then, in addition to that, as you probably know after this year, we have a, oops, okay, we have a bus driver shortage. And it takes more buses when you change the schedule, as we saw. And it also um, takes more money to have buses. And uh, yeah, I'm cracking up a little bit here. It's not my voice, I promise. Uh, so uh, it takes more buses, it takes more drivers. We have a bus driver shortage. So before we could do something like that also, we would definitely have to work on increasing our bus driver recruitment efforts, which we are working on. Um, we are definitely planning for next year to make sure that we don't have these same problems that we had this year. Our interim associate superintendent have met with him a couple of times because we've had some significant problems this year. And our school board did increase our bus driver starting salary too to work on retention. Thank you. Thank you. Is one of my prime objectives um, on the campaign. We have multiple layers of security in our current school system. We have SRO officers, we have police officers that are in the high schools and middle schools. We are adding a pilot program this year with money from the County Board of Supervisors to look at security for elementary schools. 
It is important that we continue to have proper training and protocols for all our staff to handle emergency situations. Things come up all the time. New things happen across the country and we have to constantly be aware of those. Uh, Chief of Police um, Bernard and I have talked about this at length, about the importance of making sure best practices from across the country are shared in our community. So those are all very important things. We need to, you know, I believe the best security is the security you don't see. You know, when I grew up, I didn't see armed officers walking around my school. I, I'm not sure I, I, I think that's it's something that the kids um, are happy with seeing. I mean, I think it increases anxiety. So obviously, I'd like to see good security. I'd like to see it behind the scenes. Um, the question that always comes up, or do you favor arming teachers? I will tell you, uh, absolutely not. I would never support a program that arms teachers. I find that to be absolutely ridiculous and something that we, we barely pay our teachers enough to do the job they do. Now you want to pay them to carry a weapon? I find it just, you know, a discussion that we need not have and we should spend more time on discussing appropriate security measures that make our children feel safe without increasing levels of anxiety. All of us look at that, you know, text alert when it comes across the screen that says school shooting, and we all worry about that in our kids' school and our grandkids' schools. We have to do everything we can, and we are doing everything we can to make sure we secure them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So it's a question I didn't get to answer in the first debate because I ran out of time. So I'm going to say it from the very first. No, I do not support arming teachers. And the reason is I want our teachers to focus on the students in the classroom. They need to focus on each and every one of their students. I do support arming school safety and community officers who are trained in school safety and security. And they know exactly what to look for. They know the dangers. They develop the relationships with students. They keep their ear to the ground for what to listen to, what's going on in the community, what's going on with the students and their families. So that's what we need to have, and that's what we have in place. And I'm very proud to have been a part of the school board that definitely that worked with the Board of County Supervisors and said, yes, we want to start the pilot program for the school community officers, and I'm thrilled that we're doing it. I asked about that many months ago, beginning of this year, it's even before Parkland. I saw something on social media, and I said to our risk management staff, I said, you know, that bill passed last year. Can we do this? And the conversation started. I spoke to someone who worked in one of our Board of Supervisors' offices, and, and he said, hey, what can we do for you guys this year in the school board? I said, you can help us with school safety in elementary school. And by golly, we're doing it. We started the pilot program, and I'm very excited about that. I've been a member of the Safe Schools Advisory Council. It's one of my collateral duties in the school board for many years. I'm passionate about safe schools. I've worked on bullying prevention. I've worked on suicide awareness. I've worked very hard to promote a positive school culture with our students. We've had some schools where we've had some problems and have worked very hard to help change the culture of the schools, to make it a culture of respect. Worked very hard also on mental health, as I mentioned earlier, because when we have, when we're looking out for students to, to if they have problems, if we're working early to identify students who have problems, who need help, and to help their families, to help the students to get the help they need, hopefully we're going to prevent some of the things that might happen. And in, in Prince William County Schools and nationally, we're seeing the conversation for school security is going toward mental health, and we are leading. I supported 13 school social workers. I brought that to the school board as part of our budget committee. Our school board hired 13 school social workers. Now we've got to go to Richmond, and we've got to get Richmond to help us pay for that in our standards of quality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bender? Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, when you talk about security, as you know, most of my time was with DOD. And can you imagine, uh, I worked in the Pentagon, two people would come through the, the gate, they're, ser they're not serious, they're censored as they go through. And the doors to all, our lo all the officers are locked. So we have more people there for security reasons. We don't have anybody running up and down the hallways to check on security. We only have people that check on security if you don't have a badge. But nobody's walking around wondering whether or not. So what I'm coming to, if I can consider going out, not knowing exactly what we need, uh, on a competitive bid to find out what somebody out there recommends that we do for the schools that has been associated with 
things like DOD, which have very high priorities for security. So in the meantime, the only thing we have to worry about is getting these students on and off the buses, but how you maintain them in the schools, I don't have the slightest idea. I understand that uh, the governor has set aside $1.3 million, $3 million for security. And I think you people can check on that. And with that money, we should be able to go out, get an intelligent assessment. And once we do, we'll inhibit, we will put it to the system. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on now very quickly to the closing statements. Um, Ms. Satterwhite will go first, followed by Mr. Bender, followed by Dr. Latif. Again, each candidate will have two minutes for their closing statement. Ms. Satterwhite. Thank you. Once again, thank you to Inside Nova, the Muslim Association of America, and the League of Women Voters for hosting tonight's event. And thank you all for being here with us tonight, spending your evening with us. It's been a privilege to be here with you to share a vision for continuing to improve the educational opportunities for every one of our students in Prince William County Schools. As a mother of four, I understand how important education is for our students. I became an advocate during math investigations several years ago, and I ran for school board because I wanted to make a difference for every student, parent, and child, and I wanted them to have a voice. I've worked tirelessly to listen, to research, and to advocate for all of you. I've sat in IEP meetings with my children in need of special education services, and I've helped guide parents who are also in need of those resources and assistance that they've needed for their children. I've seen firsthand the impact that overcrowded classrooms can have on our children, and I've worked very hard to make a difference and start working in the direction to reduce those class sizes, and we've seen success. I've seen the profound impact that our teachers, counselors, administrators, and support staff have as they work to instill a love of learning in our students. And I've worked hard to make sure that our teachers are compensated and treated with respect. And that's something very important with, to me, that we have respect in our schools, respect from the top down and the bottom up. Our teachers have to be treated with respect. We have to have a culture of respect in our schools. Just like you, I've seen the tragedy that's befallen too many schools across this country. And I've led in improving the safety of our schools to help ensure we're doing everything possible to protect our students and our staff members. This November 6th, I'm humbly asking you for your vote for chairman of the Prince William County School Board. I want to thank you for partnering with us with the school division. Thank you for sharing your kids, your grandkids with us. Thank you for sharing your tax dollars with us because without you, we couldn't do what we're doing for our kids. And I know that's important. I, you can trust me to spend your tax dollars responsibly. I will work tirelessly for you and for your students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bender, your closing statement, two minutes. Uh, good evening. In closing, I recognize the importance of preparing young people for college, if they want to do want to do that. But we must also prepare those students who do not want to go to college for different paths to success. Make every student count. We must prepare for tomorrow's technology and the business world. We ask more and more of our teachers with less and less until it's too late and they move on. So once again, people do not under our community does not understand the school system unless they have students in there. And if we have any opportunity to help the school system and the teachers, please make it available to your school. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Dr. Latif, two minutes. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present my vision for our school system this evening. It has been a true honor and a privilege to serve as Prince William County School Board Chair for the last five months. I've been successful in leading the school board to address issues of accountability and transparency. I've worked well with the members to focus our board on the students and their classrooms. I've also helped improve constituent services and I've impressed upon the leadership the importance of my priorities moving forward. Achieving a truly world-class education system means ensuring equity across the school division, closing the achievement gap, embracing innovative programs, engaging parents proactively about available resources, and increasing the scope of our career and technical education programs. Our students and teachers need adequate space to learn. We have to reduce the number of trailers and shrink the classroom sizes by renovating our aging schools and better planning for our county's growth. In order to learn, a child must feel safe 
We have to secure campuses. We have to ensure campuses are secure. We must increase the number of mental health professionals and school counselors, and we must continually train our staff for emergency situations. It is shameful that our teachers and staff salaries are the lowest in the region. If we want Prince William County to be a destination community, we must invest in them. Finally, I would like to appeal directly to you. I have four children in the Prince William County school system. Only one other school board member has a child in the school system currently. So I want you to know that when you are stressed out during the SOLs, I am stressed out during the SOLs. When you are anxious about breaking news alerts about school shootings, I am stressed out about breaking news alert alerts in school shootings. When you worry your child is not getting enough attention because of overcrowded classrooms, I'm worried my child is not getting enough attention in overcrowded classrooms. When you worry about losing great teachers, I worry about losing great teachers. And when you worry how your tax dollars are spent, I worry how my tax dollars are spent. If you want a voice at the table that represents your worries, your concerns, your desires, and your values, then vote for Bobber Latif, November 6th, so I can be your voice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I've got another round of applause for all three of our candidates. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Thanks also again to the uh, League of Women Voters and a reminder, of course, on their behalf to go out and vote on November 6th or vote by absentee beforehand if you're not going to be around. And thank you also to the Muslim Association of Virginia and Dar el Noor for their hospitality this evening. There are some uh, cookies and some snacks on the back, so uh, grab a snack and stick around and meet your neighbor and meet the candidates one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you all for being here and have a good night.